feel like it really sets up um, what I wanted to ask you about, which is, you know, the sort of the, the core, the core of why I invited you on half past capitalism, which is to talk about the, your sort of critique of cooperatives. Um, and I mean, it seems to me that cooperatives are a place where you can have those kinds of conversations because if you're in like a worker owned enterprise, for example, um, you actually are able to create a, a workplace where, uh, where you are valued, not just as a an automaton who can complete a task and go home at the end of the day uh, and collect a exploitative paycheck, but you're actually involved with your with your whole being, and you know, or you at least it's possible for that to be the case, uh, even if you're still dealing with the constraints of capitalism in terms of market discipline and so on. You're you're you have control over how your workplace is arranged, and you have a certain amount of agency and that that agency, and I think the theory, I, I think of a lot of people who are, you know, see cooperatives as potentially as a sort of potential agent of liberation or an engine of liberation is that they think that, um, that, that that experience can then be generalized and you can say, okay, well, if I, if we can do this in our workplace, then we can do it for all of society. Uh, and, and, and those people become you know, you can build solidarity between different parts of the labor movement, worker co-ops being one part and and other, you know, solidarity with other workers, um, with other kinds of causes, people are just more likely to to, to use the, the profits from a business to invest in their communities and so on. Um, so, so I think that's the positive part, but but I think you have some really pretty pointed things to say about the the limitations of that and and the or sort of where that goes off track. Uh, and Tell me more about that. Yeah, so I, I guess I just want to be clear when you introduce me as uh, opposing co-ops. I mean, one question is, what kind of co-ops are we talking about? Because 90% of, I, I don't just mean, I mean, 90% of co-ops are actually consumer co-ops or credit co-ops. They're not about controlling uh, your workplace and your life. So, so there's a different criticism when you say, uh, you know, some major corporation that just decided to give workers some pro uh, profit sharing checks or some uh, stock. And often those kinds of things aren't about, they have nothing to do with control. In fact, they're about integrating workers. In fact, to make it even more crude, it's often about keeping a union out by giving workers something, or if there is a union, uh, getting concessions and asking workers to buy it because we're gonna give you some stock in the company and you may get it back later. So we have to really be clear about what kind of co-ops, what kind of worker involvement we're talking about. And that's critical because there's a lot of evangelical stuff about this, uh, these other things, which, which have nothing to do with transforming capitalism. So I, that's one thing I'd say. I guess the other thing occurs to me is the title of your program, which I, I hadn't realized until you said it, but half capital, half ca halfway to, ca what is it again? Half. Half past capitalism. Half past capitalism. Yeah, you have to think about whether, you know, the limits of partial measures is, is always a crucial question. Sometimes partial measures uh, can be harmful or, or can't get you there. So you skipped over it, but the context in which you're doing this is absolutely vital. If you're taking over workplaces, um, uh, you know, in, in a highly competitive environment, and that highly competitive environment says, uh, well, if you really want to survive, you're going to have to behave like us. Well, that's a real problem. That's just not a, it's not just a side effect. It's why when you actually look at co-ops, a lot of them uh, try to move into sectors where competition isn't a factor. Well, you know, because of lifestyle, you, you, you're ready to accept a lower wage, coffee shops, you know, book, uh, a bookstore, so you have to think about those things, that the context is so important because you can end up, and, and there's an important lesson there. The lesson there isn't that co-ops are bad, but that you have to change the context as well. So for example, uh, uh, you know, you look at the, Argent the takeovers in Argentina. Uh, well, it was very impressive. You know, I would be fully supportive of you know, workers uh, losing their jobs and thinking about what they do next. And they say, shit, let's take this over. Well, I would completely defend that. The question is, is it a strategy 
for winning the world, or is it a defensive strategy that you should support because people are fighting back? So it raises a lot of questions. One question is, uh, if you're gonna start changing the world, would you take over what capital doesn't want? Or would you take over the, the heights of the economy, the most important things? Are you gonna go to the margins and start a credit union? Or are you gonna take over the banks? You know, are you gonna say, maybe we can make um, a component for the auto industry, or maybe we should take over General Motors? You have to ask yourself those questions. What are you taking over? And if you're taking over the duds, if, you, you know, if it's kind of a lemon socialism, we're gonna take over what capitalism doesn't want, uh, you can see workers doing it because what, else, what other choice do those workers have? But it's not a strategy. And I, I would distinguish between that, doing something to defend yourself versus a strategy. You know, we had the example after the last financial crisis at Republic Windows. It was, uh, UE was the union, a uh, very militant union, they had militant local leadership, uh, and uh, the company wasn't gonna get its finances, so they were gonna fold. Workers took it over. But what do you do with windows? You have to sell them and you have to sell them in competition. So there was 240 workers and everybody you know, cheered the song, which I thought was great, that should be cheered on, but making it into an answer is different. So one question is, well, how do we spread this everywhere? Is this gonna be an example that excites everybody? Well, it didn't, because to excite everybody, you have to go out and organize. You have to say, hey, this is happening. Why don't you do it? And talk about, can you do it? And what would you do with it if you did it? Um, so first of all, you immediately have the question of organizing for it to spread. It doesn't spread automatically. People are too demoralized. They've been defeated too long. Then you have the question of what do you do with it? And uh, everybody talked about it when it happened and then stopped talking about it. And that's one of the things that bothers me. We have to be sober about it and actually analyze and follow these things up. What happened with them is that uh, the 240 workers ended up to be 17 workers. So that's all the business they could get. The 17 workers, were no longer covered by the minimum wage, which was already lousy in the States because they were a co-op. So what we should have been doing is saying, well, why did that happen? And then you get into strategic questions. You know, do we have to change the context? Do we have to take over industries where the government can be the buyer and push them to do it? Hospital equipment, again, book publishing. Uh, so, you know, they found that in uh, Argentina as well. They needed the state involved. You know, one thing in Argentina was that um, they declared them legal co-ops, which meant that they were actually liable for the debts of the company. So when they took them over, not only did they get rundown equipment because capital was moving out, they suddenly owed all this money. And then, you know, if they didn't do that, they accepted it because if they didn't do that, if they didn't have any legal ownership, uh, they couldn't borrow money. Nobody would lend you money unless there were assets. So, you know, they faced these questions immediately. The, the, co the uh, takeover plant that I visited in uh, Buenos Aires was uh, uh, making blenders. They couldn't compete with China. In that case, Argentina actually put tariffs up on the China things as emergency tariffs, and that allowed them to survive. And you're right about the good things they did. They were great on uh, equalizing things within the workplace. They are great on health and safety questions. They actually cooperated on the work. You know, when you're working for a capitalist enterprise, you're always trying to protect your knowledge. Because if you give them all the knowledge, they always take advantage of it. They'll use it to make you work harder. They'll use it to lay off people. But here, nobody was worried about that. So they all just cooperated. Uh, so, you know, there's those positive things and it shows you the potentials. But then it raises those big questions. Well, what do you do about competition? What do you do about free trade? What do you do about corporations having the right to move? What do you do about the fact that you're taking over the weakest parts of the system? And what you found was that it didn't spread, uh, that workers either didn't feel capable or didn't think it was impressive enough. So a lot of them survived. I mean, a lot of workers felt like this is better than nothing. It's better than working for somebody else. And that was fine. But it didn't become a model. It didn't lead to Argentinian workers saying, let's do this everywhere. Because then you have to talk about, you know, so the positive thing, the, the reason that socialists have to be involved is that there's a tendency, and I think here I am critical of the left, there's a tendency to find examples and cheerlead them, which is this is the new model. 
And when they fail, we move to another model. And we do this with countries. It's Venezuela one day, then it's Bolivia. The real point about these international stuff is we should show international solidarity. But the real point is these are experiments. Let's learn from them. And let's learn the good, you know, in terms of what you're saying. What did they do? You know, they actually showed that, hey, workers can actually run a factory. Let's do the good and then learn, talk about the limits. You know, how are they going to get technical expertise? How are they going to get finance? How are they going to get markets? And when you start talking about that, that's when you're really talking about capitalism. Because capitalism, yeah. it's about social labor in terms of organizing social labor in a factory, but it's actually about organizing it in society. And when you start thinking about organizing it in society, that's when it gets really complicated. I have no trouble imagining workers running a workplace. When I get to think about, well, how do you organize a whole society democratically? I have no examples. Uh, I can think of all the problems. It's harder but, for but sure, it, yeah. But it doesn't depress me. You know, it just tells me what we have to do. And if you know what you have to do, then you can start getting at it. But if you keep pretending that you've got the answer, you'll never get to thinking about what you really need to do.